5th of July 1948, the National Assistance Act comes into force. This Assistance Act formally dispenses with the poor laws and in its place creates a National Assistance Board to provide maintenance to those who, for whatever reason, can't receive sufficient insurance benefits. So with this, the granting of welfare to the poor only on condition that they can be said to demonstrate deserving traits, conditionality, you must be industrious, thrifty, a good parent to receive welfare, that distinction becomes, it disappears. The legal distinction between the deserving and the undeserving disappears in 1948. In principle, it's a huge moment. Residence in the UK is now the key criterion for being deserving of welfare assistance, not your character. In the same year though, another significant piece of legislation, the Nationality Act. The Home Office wants the colonies and dominions to have separate citizenships to the UK. After all, the doors are open now for all subjects of the Crown to avail themselves of universal welfare by simply travelling to the Metropole. The colonial office disagrees. Separate citizenship would destroy the empire and with that the sterling area, the economic basis of Britain's fragile post-war recovery. The colonial office wins temporarily and so the Nationality Act of 1948 grants all subjects of the empire British citizenship. What a turnaround. Just think back to the fallout of Morant Bay. But now the imperial Anglo-Saxon family and the non-white colonial subjects are legally reunited through a shared citizenship. And not only that, there's no legal provision for dividing the poor into deserving and undeserving populations. So, citizenship is universal and welfare is universal. Hooray! Things aren't quite so simple. The real problem is labour. The UK needs it badly as part of its post-war reconstruction. And here is where the racialised distinction between the Anglo-Saxon family, the deserving, and the non-white colonial subject, the undeserving, here is where that racialised distinction is informally reintroduced. Informally reintroduced. In fact, at this point in time, the government prefers non-citizen European workers, Polish even, yes, even Poles, to the labour of their own black citizens, especially from the Caribbean. In 1946, the Labour government convenes a cabinet committee to determine informal ways to stem the dark tide of labour coming from the colonies. A working party report comments on the undeserving traits of black labourers in England who lack stamina, possess volatile temperament, and whose women display a slow mentality. What's more, the working party suggests that patriarchy itself is under threat, and with that, the purity of the imperial white family. Sexual unions between black and white women of the lowest types threatens to unleash the energies of wild half-castes upon the land. Remember how important William Gordon's case had been. In conclusion, the working party warns, under a Labour government, by the way, the black citizens could become a charge on national assistance. But it's not just the government that tries to reintroduce the racialised distinction between deserving and undeserving poor. In fact, the unions are perhaps more guilty than the government. Let me explain. The welfare system emerges as part of what you can call a national compact. A national compact through which Britain, in desperate straits, might recover from the wars. This national compact is between state, business and labour. The national compact mitigates against conflict over work, and the welfare system is part of that, takes the cost of reproduction. <laughs> the shop steward, though, becomes a key figure in this national compact. Through the closed shop system, the shop steward negotiates with management on behalf of factory workers for better wages, working conditions, etc. And it's through this system that an informal colour bar is introduced that makes for a racialised division of labour. Unions 
are amongst the first to protect, to protest against the movement of black citizens to Britain, arguing that their labour is cheap and will therefore be used to undermine collective bargaining. Numerous examples exist of local unions undertaking protest actions against increases in the employment of black labour. Shop stewards regularly agitate for a localised quota system that restricts black labour to around 5% of the workforce. Shop stewards make informal agreements with management that black labour will be the first to be fired in the case of redundancies. And this informal colour bar ensures that black labour will be channelled into either existing low skill sectors that white workers have left for better paid sectors or into de-skilled roles created by the introduction of new technology. And so, in the context of near full employment throughout the 50s and the 60s and the 70s even, black workers occupied jobs vacated by white workers. In fact, this is, at this point in time, it's, it's South Asian and black workers experience ex almost exactly the same thing. They disproportionately represent in semi or unskilled roles compared to white workers and still disproportionately occupy undesirable roles characterised by shift work, unsociable hours, low pay and unpleasant working condition. Basically, the gig economy is not a new thing. It's just that now the gig economy is open to white people. This is exactly the conditions that black women face, especially as they underwrite the expansion of the NHS. So here it is. The white working class have finally been incorporated as an indigenous constituency at the moment when the distinction between deserving and undeserving poor is formally erased through citizenship and welfare legislation, but where this distinction is informally re-racialised as deserving white and undeserving black. Labour. I repeat that. The white working class have finally become a constituency at that moment where the distinction between deserving and undeserving is formally erased in terms of citizenship and welfare legislation, but where that distinction is informally re-racialised as deserving white and undeserving black labour. It's not that the white working class are all rich. It's not that all of them occupy plush, skilled, manual jobs. It is the case, though, that collectively they are relatively advantaged in the division of labour by virtue of being white. And that is the allure of being courted as a white working class constituency in post-colonial Britain. It's the one institutionalised moment in British history where whiteness might save you even if you're poor. Just one.